It is my pleasure to welcome you all here this evening to Claude Nicolier's Leçon d'Honneur. It is a great personal honor to introduce Professor Nicolier. He is a man who exemplifies what we strive for at EPFL, personally focused in his engagement with students and international in the scope of his ambitions and accomplishments. He's a science explorer at heart, and his double training as an astrophysicist and pilot made him a clear choice for the European Space Agency when they were looking for the first astronauts back in 1978. In his rather unique position as scientist and astronaut, Claude Nicolier personifies the spirit of scientific research with his never-ending journey in uncharted territories. After having flown abroad four of the five space shuttles in the 1990s, he is now a core member of Solar Impulse team, whose solar airplane just finished its first leg from Abu Dhabi to Muscat in Oman as part of a record-breaking world tour. Yet it is not in the Middle East where the Swiss astronaut story began, but several generations ago in the nearby lakeside town of Vevey, where his great-great-grandfather invented and built the first ever chocolate bar manufacturing process. François-Louis Cayet, transformed the industrial landscape of the region with his almost magical, ingeniously engineered apparatus. A generation later, his great-grandfather, Daniel Peter, not only invented milk chocolate, but his keen business sense contributed to the reputation of Switzerland throughout the world. This evening, over 100 years later, Claude Nicolier will soon give his leçon d'honneur at EPFL, not about milk chocolate or business, but on gravity, a subject that few others know so intimately. He's among the elite few, I was just told around five to six hundredths, that have performed a spacewalk and only Swiss to do so. Yet this intimate relationship with gravity didn't begin when he upgraded the, Hub the Hubble telescope in an eight-hour eight hour spacewalk in 1999 at the age of 55 when he was 20 old years older than the shuttle's pilot, but perhaps when he was himself a young military pilot. I was told a very interesting story. One Saturday afternoon after lunch, Claude Nicolier went out to the garden piled two tables on top of each other and a chair on top of that. He climbed to the top of the structure and then leaped, out, leaped off, landed, and rolled to a stop. He was practicing the landing exercise per parachute jump to his family amusement. This anecdote says a lot about Claude. This rare combination of courage, spontaneity, and rigor makes Professor Great Nicolier a great teacher. He is able to transmit his enthusiasm for science and space exploration to the next generation of engineers and researchers here at EPFL. His master's course on space mission design and operations is so popular with students that we decided to share it, believe it or not, with ETH Zurich, where it continues to be a hit. Also, thanks in part to his active participation to the Swiss Cube project, students here built the first ever Swiss satellite. As someone who has spent more than 40 days in space, he also knows the dangers of space debris. And his guidance to the EPFL Clean Space One project has been very precious. Let me just state a few elements from his official CV. In 1966, he obtained his military pilot license from Swiss Air Force Militia. In 1970, he was awarded a bachelor's degree in physics from our neighbor, the University of Lausanne. From 1970 to 73, he worked as a scientist at the Institute of Astronomy 
of the Lausanne University and at the Geneva Observatory. In 1997, he attended Swiss Civil and Aviation School in Zurich to become a pilot on DC-9 for Swiss Air. In 1975, he completed the Degré du Troisième Cycle in Astrophysics from Geneva University. And as we know, we know, in May 1980, he joined NASA while remaining at ESA to attend training as a mission specialist. He was appointed professor at EPFL as a professor titulaire in 1994. And I do remember this very vividly because we were two young professors had been nominated professor titulaire and we had to give a lecture, an inaugural lecture, and I had to follow Claude. It's a very tough job, I can tell you. And I do remember vividly his beautiful pictures and here was I to come to speak about neuroengineering after having spoke about space. But I think what is very interesting is since he retired as an astronaut in 2007, Claude made a strong commitment to education, to teaching at EPFL. And this was highly, highly appreciated. He has received many awards, including the NASA Distinguished Service Medal in 2001, four NASA flight medals for flight STS-46, 61, 75, and 103. He's also received the Yuri Gagarin Gold Medal of the International Aeronautical Federation in 94, and the Silver Net of the National Air and Space Academy of France in 1994 also. But the most amazing thing is that Claude Nicolier continues to defy gravity. So I would like to welcome him to the podium to share his in-depth knowledge of one of the laws of physics that has accomplished him throughout his that has accompanied him throughout his long and accomplished career. And I would just have a last little wish. I don't want you to finish just here. You need to continue. And as you know, there is a new way to teach in the world called MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. You know that I'm also so very fond of this. And I know that people, people have spoke to you about it. And my last wish would be that you record one of those MOOCs on your course. I think that would be a fantastic. So you're not entirely retired. We don't, will not allow you to do so because we want, and a lot of those people in this room would be delighted to take your future course on MOOC on space. Thanks a lot. Well, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Patrick, Mr. President, for these uh, kind words. And you can be sure that uh, MOOCs is, uh, is in the pipeline. It's going to be uh, this uh, summer and the fall that we'll be recording my lectures so that uh, uh, beyond my teaching, ex cathedra, uh, this course will be continuing over the next, uh, next few years. And uh, good afternoon, dear friends, family members, colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's really a pleasure to be here and I would like to thank the Presidency, Patrick Gabichet in particular, for giving me the opportunity to teach uh, for the last uh, 10 years. I was nominated professor in 94, but I only really formally started teaching in 2004, so 10 years ago. Uh, thank you also for Dimitri uh, Psaltis for giving me the opportunity to teach within the engineering faculty. STI, Sciences et Techniques de l'Ingénieur. Uh, last but not least, uh, thank you to Volker Gass for giving me a nest uh, within the Swiss Space Center to continue my activity here at EPFL and beyond EPFL. Uh, for me, it has been a, a real pleasure to teach for the last uh, 10 years here at EPFL in this uh, uh, institution with very uh, high standards. Uh, it was really a privilege. And it was for me, in a way, um, uh, a continuation of the journey. Because I think that after having experienced what I had the privilege of experiencing in spaceflight, uh, teaching it and bringing the message to young people, students, uh, is a continuation of the journey. Now, you may be surprised that I, I chose to talk about uh, gravity, because uh, I'm one of the few in this room who experienced uh, the lack of gravity or the absence of gravity, or, I will talk about this later, the compensation of gravity by inertial forces. Uh, there is another one, Thomas uh, Reiter, who is here, who is uh, <coughs> uh, presently the director of uh, human spaceflight 
and operations at the European Space Agency, who spent much more time than, uh, than I spent in space. He spent nearly a year in space, six months or about six months in the Mir space station and about six months in the International Space Station. Um, <coughs> and uh, thank you for Thomas uh, for giving me the honor of your presence here. Um, again, strange to talk about uh, gravity when you have experienced the, the lack of it, uh, but the the subject is a fascinating subject, and uh, for me it was an opportunity to, to learn about this concept of gravity. For, for me, the best way to learn about the subject deeply is to teach it. And this is a lesson, this is not a lecture, this is a lesson. And uh, I had the privilege of uh, reading quite a lot about gravity and about the history of the concept, and this is for me a great pleasure. Um, <coughs> this uh, title page is uh, a picture taken by the Cassini spacecraft, and in a way, it uh, illustrates gravity. This is, of course, Saturn, uh, the rings of Saturn. Um, and obviously, the rings of Saturn stay around Saturn because of gravity. That's obvious. The shape of uh, Saturn itself is because of gravity. Uh, it generates always uh, spherical objects, maybe somewhat flattens if there's rotation, fast rotation. And this picture taken by Cassini again is remarkable because where this arrow is, is uh, the Earth. And uh, it, I just made it so that it's close to EPFL. This is where we are. We are here <laughs> at the distance of about uh, 400 million kilometers, or about uh, one light hour. OK, so <clears throat> I, I've always been told that you need to say what you are going to talk about, and at the end, you need to, to summarize what you said. So I'm going to follow that rule. And uh, this is what I'm going to talk about, the introduction I started already. I'll talk about the modulation of gravity by inertial forces, and not only in space, but also in the atmosphere. Uh, we'll go in space, and I'll show you some of the effect of uh, absence of gravity, or let's say uh, uh, no gravity or zero g in, space, in the space environment. I'll talk about the history of the concept through Galileo, Newton, and Einstein. Now, I have to say a few words also about Gravity the movie, because when you, talk, when you say gravity, uh, obviously the movie comes uh, to mind uh, with George Clooney and Sandra Bullock, and there will be a conclusion then. And again, if you go to a search engine, uh, to Google, and you put gravity, you find uh, a full page of uh, Gravity the movie. And you have pictures of uh, George Clooney and uh, Sandra Bullock, and uh, extract of the, of the movie. And uh, you really need to go to the second, third, or fourth page in order to find uh, <coughs> more statement about gravity. Gravity is, in fact, also a natural phenomenon by which all physical bodies attract each other. Gravity gives weight to every object on the surface of the Earth. Um, it's interesting to see that uh, a successful movie is a uh, really driving uh, concept into the movie itself and uh, taking it away from the physical reality. Now, it's important to realize that gravity is absolutely everywhere. And the concept of zero gravity is, in fact, not a correct concept. There is no place in the universe where there is zero gravity. The only place where there would be zero gravity would be uh, in a fictitious universe massless, where there would be no mass. That'd be a pretty boring universe anyway, so uh, gravity is everywhere. Even the gravity due to the Earth, of course, uh, it keeps the Moon on its orbit at about 400,000 kilometers. Uh, it keeps satellites on orbit around the, our planet, but at distance way beyond the Moon, it's still non-zero value of the gravity of the Earth. Zero gravity doesn't exist. I will use the word sometimes ton uh, tonight, but uh, you have to be aware of the fact that zero gravity doesn't exist. You have a modulation of the forces of gravity by inertial forces. I'll talk about that, obviously, but zero gravity doesn't exist. Now, gravity is a so-called weak force compared to other fundamental forces uh, in uh, nature, especially at a small scale, at the scale of the uh, atom or even uh, uh, of the nucleus of the, of the atom. Um, the other forces, the so-called weak force, the strong force, and the electromagnetic uh, forces are much, much, much higher in value than gravity. In fact, an atom doesn't care about gravity. 
uh, these other forces, three other forces that I mentioned are much more important. But gravity obviously is very important at macroscopic uh, level, um, at the level of uh, stars, uh, galaxies or planetary system like the solar system. Now, modulating gravity by inertial forces. Uh, now, you can take out gravity by a proper shape of a trajectory in the atmosphere, for instance. So that's what I call modulation of the gravity forces by inertial forces. What are inertial forces? Inertial forces are forces that you have if you are in a reference frame that is accelerated. If you are uh, on the highway with a car at constant speed and a straight line, there are no inertial forces. Uh, if you make a turn with a car, you have an inertial force that will be opposite the direction of the turn. If you turn uh, pretty swiftly to the left, you have, of course, the inertial force uh, to the right. Uh, if you're on an airplane and uh, the air is completely calm and you are on cruise at a certain altitude, flying straight and level, there are no inertial forces. If you close your eyes, it's as if you were in a room, like in this room now. If there's turbulence, there are inertial forces, up and down, left, right. Uh, so you have inertial forces whenever you have a reference frame that is accelerated, that is deferring in its motion from straight at a constant speed. And uh, in some situations, you can uh, take out the gravity forces, at least partly or magnified by inertial forces. Uh, in a spacecraft within a gravity field, and it can be a complex gravity field, not only in a... Uh, on orbit around the Earth, for instance, or around the Sun, but it can be a complex gravity field by several bodies attracting each other. Uh, the gravity is completely taken out by inertial forces. And uh, the force of gravity uh, means, this is Newton's second law, an acceleration. An acceleration is going to drive uh, the spacecraft on a, on a, on a given trajectory. And because there is acceleration of the spacecraft, there is an inertial force in the spacecraft that is exactly taking out the gravity force. So this is a way to understand why we have weightlessness in a, in a spacecraft. You have the acceleration force due to the gravity forces in the vicinity of the spacecraft, and you have inertial vo force or acceleration exactly opposite the, uh, the, the gravity force or acceleration. Now, <coughs> this uh, inertial force is really a force that you have, it's, sometimes it's called a pseudo-force. It's not a force that is described in uh, Newton's law, for instance. And uh, <coughs> it's if you have a reference frame attached to the spacecraft, that's in this reference frame that you have this force. And um, uh, you can also understand the weightlessness by imagining that all of the objects within the spacecraft are following the same trajectory. The spacecraft itself and everything inside, whether it's an astronaut, whether the toothbrush or anything in the spacecraft, is following the same trajectory. So this gives you a weightlessness condition. And uh, you have here an illustration, well-known illustration in Tata on a marché sur la lune, where you have uh, Le Capitaine Haddock who is floating and uh, his whiskey is taking uh, the spherical shape, and uh, Milou, the, the dog, is floating also. This is following the action by the Frère Dupont, who switched off the, uh, the rocket engine, of that rocket uh, uh, moving towards, uh, towards the moon. So there's suddenly weightlessness uh, in the spacecraft, and everything is floating. And in a way, you can understand that by imagining that all of these objects, the Capitaine Haddock, the dog, the whiskey in ball form, are following the same trajectory. That's one way to see it. The other way is that all of the gravity forces on all these objects are exactly taken out by inertial forces. Now, it's also possible in an airplane, especially a fast airplane, to modulate the gravity forces by a proper trajectory in the vertical plane. Um, so this is something you, do, you don't do in space, you do in, uh, in, the, in the atmosphere. And you can get either an increased gravity, 
and uh, we call them g-forces on an airplane, or reduced gravity, or zero gravity for a while, or even negative gravity. And uh, from a pilot's comfort point of view, it's always desirable to have so-called positive g's, in the sense that the sum of the uh, Earth gravity uh, vector and of the inertial forces due to the motion of the airplane, the trajectory of the airplane, you try to have this sum such that you have a force towards the bottom of the cockpit or the cabin. Uh, so you have the blood moving toward the leg and not towards the head, which is very uncomfortable. And uh, for instance, if you are uh, in a fast airplane and you have taken a Hawker Hunter, it's a pretty fast airplane, and uh, you have mountains here, uh, if you want to stay close uh, to the ground, by going over that ridge, you go inverted. And uh, you pull on uh, the, the stick so that you have a curvature of the trajectory here such that the inertial acceleration is larger than the gravity vector. And this will give you a positive G, which means that uh, you'll feel comfortable in the cabin. You don't have negative G, which is, again, very uncomfortable. And so this is the way to fly over a ridge. If you are fly a low altitude here and you want to stay low altitude here, you go inverted over the ridge. Okay? Now, if you fly a looping, for instance, in the bottom of the looping, this is again a Hawker Hunter, a famous fighter bomber of the Swiss Air Force uh, since uh, the mid-50s. Uh, <clears throat> now, if you follow that trajectory, of course, you have centrifugal force, which is the inertial acceleration in the low part of the looping, and you have the G. So you have uh, a total g-force which is beyond one, typically three, four, maybe five g's. Then you go up the looping, and on the top here, because your speed is much lower, you exchange uh, kinetic energy into potential energy. Maybe your inertial uh, acceleration is much lower, could be more or less equal to g, which means that you are nearly in zero g on top of the looping. That's okay. You just don't want to have negative g because it's uncomfortable. And I have a little video clip that will illustrate that. Uh, we took off from Bayern with a, with a hunter, a two-seat uh, Hawker hunter. Uh, this was about a year ago. And uh, here we go. We, are, we just flew over the Alec Gletscher close to Brig. Uh, we go toward the bottom of the Rhone Valley. And we make a pretty tight turn to the, to the right to enter a side valley, which is called the Gredetstal, uh, going to the north from about uh, Visp or Brig, and here we go. And we'll fly pretty low altitude over that valley because we want to demonstrate to you that we you fly low, and you want to stay low on the other side of the ridge, and you're going to have to go inverted over the ridge. Here we go. It's pretty nice landscape here. We know there are no cables here, so that's okay. You can fly low. Uh, we don't disturb anybody either because there's nobody walking in that uh, little valley, okay? We pull a little bit here. We still have about 1G because we are nearly straight trajectory and a little bit of a bank to the right in order to adjust the place where we fly over the ridge. And when you come over the ridge, you don't want to push on the stick. You go inverted and you pull and you have positive G there. It's really cool. <laughs> and uh, as you know, the geography of Switzerland, you know that we come to Lötschental now. Um, and continuing to the bottom of the uh, Lötschental. So this is a demonstration of the modulation of gravity forces by inertial forces by selecting the proper curvature of the profile uh, in the vertical plane. Now, you can use that to obtain a pure zero-g zero condition with a fast airplane. And uh, there are several companies who do that. There are a few in the United States. There's one in France called Novespace, uh, making this available to researchers for the European Space Agency, for instance, uh, or EPFL students. You started about... Uh, uh, 6,000 meters, you put uh, the nose up of this Airbus uh, 300, about 60 degrees nose up, and then the idea is to push on the stick and then uh, modulate also the power so that you emulate an exact free fall or zero-g trajectory, which is in fact nearly a parabola. In fact, it's more like an ellipse, portion of an ellipse, a very elongated ellipse with the focus of this ellipse being at the center of the Earth, but practically a parabola. And uh, you get a uh, zero-g period for about 25 seconds. And uh, I have a, a here an illustration of a similar phenomenon. If you have a, a spray water in a, in, a, in a park, it gives you a, a, a shape which is very similar to what this 
uh, Airbus is going to fly in order to generate zero G in the cabin. And I have a short video clip that was provided by Jean-François Clairvoy, who is the CEO of uh, Novespace based in France. And uh, let's start it. Here we go. Uh, Airbus A300 zero G airplane. Uh, offering these services to either universities or the European Space Agency or uh, tourists, people who just want to experience that uh, similar condition as you have in space, but for a short period of time of 25 seconds. Here we go. Uh, the crew is increasing the power and then lifting the nose of the airplane until you get about uh, 60 degrees nose up attitude. And here you have maybe a G and a half or two Gs. For a short time you have again one G because you are flying straight without changing uh, the direction or the pitch angle. That now he starts to push so as to emulate again the zero G trajectory. And he, what's, this is what's happening in the cabin. Now, these are people who are mainly enjoying it, but again, you can use this for research also and doing experiments. It's cool, it's really cool. <laughs> And it's possible also to simulate uh, G condition that exists on the moon with one six G or on Mars with one, one third of a G. Here you have pure zero G. This is the end of the parabola and the people come on the ground. And this is seen from outside, this parabola. Uh, again, from about 60 degrees nose up, the pilots push on the stick and uh, emulate this free fall. The idea is to really emulate a free fall uh, with uh, this airplane. Now, the company uh, S3, Swiss Space System in uh, Bayern, is also going to provide, starting this year, the possibility of flying zero G uh, for tourists. Now, we had the EPFL uh, team using this uh, platform to do research in uh, microgravity conditions. Uh, this is a team with uh, Philippe Cobel, who should be here in the room, and uh, they studied the uh, behavior of uh, bubbles uh, in uh, microgravity conditions and uh, especially the, the study of the so-called cavitation uh, with these bubbles that break into uh, <coughs> two different directions, opposite directions and it was the subject of an uh, article of the Physical Review Letters in uh, 2006. So again, it's the zero-g airplane, it's uh, to have fun and enjoy zero-g but also very much to do uh, experiments uh, using the microgravity conditions. I was involved also in some of these. This is not too much a part of astronaut training. You do very little of it. But uh, in 2004, when I was still in Houston, we did evaluation of a uh, repair of a uh, damaged, supposedly damaged, uh, thermal protection system of the shuttle. This is following the Columbia accident that, of course, was uh, resulting from damage of the thermal protection system. And you see I have uh, EVA gloves here, and this is in between uh, this experiment that we did. I was, we just uh, took a little free time uh, to enjoy the microgravity conditions. But again, it's used very much uh, for research or for evaluations before taking equipment uh, to space. Let's go to space now. Uh, Space Shuttle, and uh, here we are uh, on orbit, uh, typically about 300, 4, 5, 600 kilometers above the Earth's surface, beautiful view. Um, we are on orbit, we get weightless this time for a long time, much longer than in the Airbus 300 of Novespace. Uh, in some cases for a very, very long time, and uh, Thomas Reiter here experienced that again two times, once on Mir for nearly six months, and another six months in the International Space Station, product of cooperation between 16 countries, United States, Russia, Canada, Japan, and 12 members of the European Space Agency. Now, um, when you do spacewalking, uh, obviously you have uh, zero-g conditions or microgravity conditions. You need to be really careful. You need to uh, always hold the structure. And uh, you have a safety tether in case you don't hold it anymore at least you'll be able to get back to the spaceship uh, following the, the tether 
uh, the safety tether that you have here. You need to really, really, really be careful. Very often it is thought that spacewalking is just fun. It's fun, yes, but uh, you need to be really careful. Um, <clears throat> there's one astronaut, Bruce McCandless, who had the opportunity in uh, 1984, uh, three years after the shuttle started operation in 1981, uh, to go on an untethered, without safety tether, spacewalk with a manned maneuvering unit. And he's about uh, 300 meters away from the space shuttle, moving at 28,000 kilometers an hour around the Earth, just like this. Yeah? This is really cool. And uh, if you ever have the opportunity to do this, you should say yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we go inside the cabin. Inside the cabin, of course, it's also zero G. And he, this is on my first space flight in uh, the summer of 92. Uh, two of my colleagues, I cannot recognize them here, uh, are, are looking through the front window of the, sp of the spacecraft looking at the Earth during the night. Nice picture. And you see, of course, you have to be careful because you have your feet near the switches here on the... Uh, ceiling, but you see all of the switches are guarded with uh, metal loops on the side, so they don't have too much risk of changing the position of critical switches with your feet on the ceiling. That's a nice picture of my uh, commander, Lauren Shriver, eating M&Ms or Smarties that move slowly from his open hand on the, on, on the right to his mouth on the left. And this is a nice picture taken on my last mission in 1999 with Jean-Francois Clairvoy of the European Space Agency, who is a robot arm operator, and I was one of the spacewalkers. Uh, <coughs> nice picture also taken on the International Space Station, uh, Sandra Magnus, American astronaut, uh, with an American colleague. And these are fresh fruits, which uh, sometimes are brought to the International Space Station using resupply vehicles, but you only have these fresh fruit for, for a few days. After that, you have to eat uh, dehydrated fruit that you rehydrate with water. A nice picture. Now, um, the gases don't care too much about microgravity conditions. The, the solids don't care too much either, except that they're floating around. But liquids are affected in a significant manner. And of course, liquids, because you have basically zero-g conditions are going to take a shape such that each direction is, equally, is equal, which means obviously a sphere. You won't have a cube or anything like that, but each direction having the same importance gives you a sphere. And this is the kind of thing that is never recommended to do in the spaceship, because if it goes to electronic systems, you get blamed or you get problems. But anyway, it's irresistible, so you do it still. But you have towers in the vicinity. And uh, this is on my first mission. This is Jeff Hoffman, a very, very good friend of mine, who is, by the way, teaching aerospace engineering at MIT at this time. And uh, we have a, a water a volume on his nose. And uh, we did it such that uh, in the following uh, seconds, we had this volume of water moving towards his uh, right eye. And you see, it moves to his right eye. <laughs> and then it's like a big tear that he has uh, with interesting optical uh, properties so that his eye is magnified. So playing with fluids, again, is irresistible. It's so much fun. Huh? <laughs> now, this is uh, Don Pettit, an American astronaut who is a very good uh, uh, experimental physicist, and he's demonstrating drinking tea with uh, chopsticks. Um, he prepared tea in this bag, and uh, eventually there was a big ball of tea here, and he approached the chopsticks, which of course have a larger surface than the end of this uh, tube. And uh, because of uh, <coughs> capillarity forces, the T chose to stick on the chopsticks, and he's taking slowly this ball of tea to his mouth to drink uh, tea with chopsticks. Try to do this here on Earth is very difficult. In zero G, it's possible. And uh, Don Petit. Uh, Again, a very good experimental physicist. He did a lot of uh, experiments with fluids in weightlessness. And uh, here you have a volume of liquid which is held in place by um, <coughs> um, a piece of metal, a very thin piece of metal, uh, just to keep it in place. And then he's uh <coughs> producing puffs of air uh, from the left-hand side, and you'll see the very interesting shape that results, and also the formation of a couple of uh, volumes of water. Every time you do a puff from a given direction, you have a recoil then that forms two uh, particles of water that you will see. 
and uh, he's going to describe it. And it's, it's really an interesting video that was uh, uh, published a couple of years ago. Uh, let's go. Listen to him. Oh, I just love that. Love that. Look at that. Look at that. Amazing. Just one of these jaw-dropping moments. Okay, here we go to do it again. Looking into the camera. Big buff. Here we go. Oh, right at the lens. I saved the lens. What I'm planning to do is, after this whole series of experiments, I'll suck all this water up with a syringe, I'll put it back in bags, and I'll use it to make tea with, so I'll end up drinking my experiment. <laughs> don't bet it likes tea you or not. You've got to conserve huh? your resources <laughs> when you're in the frontier. You don't get to see this as common, intuitive, observables on Earth. And so when we go into a frontier, our normal earth honed intuition no longer applies. And this, this rule works when you go to the bottom of the ocean or into the stratus. Now, burning is quite interesting in the microgravity conditions also. Uh, this is a normal candle on the left-hand side. And of course, if you have a candle, <clears throat> uh, you have convection. The hot gases are going up and are drawing uh, oxygen uh, towards uh, the, <coughs> the burning area here, so it maintains itself. But in microgravity conditions, you don't have any convection. So that if you try to light a candle, it burns for a little while, but then it takes that spherical shape, and there is no uh, supply of oxygen there, so it dies after a short while. And there has been a lot of uh, uh, studies done, experiments done on combustions in the zero-g conditions. Okay, let's go now to the uh, history of the concept of gravity, rather rapidly through the history. Again, three names stand out in a very clear manner. Galileo, Newton, and Einstein. Now, <clears throat> Galileo was a very, very, very bright uh, scientist. Uh, he was, in fact, the first experimental scientist doing experiment to understand uh, phenomenon. Invented the refracting telescope, observed planets, was, of course, a fan of heliocentrism, studied sunspots, and he tried to determine the law of the falling bodies, making the experiments with uh, uh, different masses uh, from the top of the Tower of uh, Pisa. At least this is what, this is, what uh, is, is being told. I'm not so sure it happened, and some people doubt that, but he certainly made experiments about falling bodies. Now, <coughs> Uh, before Galileo, it was always assumed that if you have a large mass, it's going to fall down more rapidly than a small mass. Uh, Galileo's observed that uh, the two masses, of course, there were some deviations due to the atmospheric drag. You have to imagine that you have no atmosphere, but Galileo basically found out that whatever the weight of the object is going to fall down at the same time and, and reach the, the ground at the same time. Now, um, there were no direct conclusions from Galileo about that, but it helped uh, Newton uh, to establish his laws, and I'll, I'll mention that in a few minutes. But um, on Apollo 15, on EVA, extravehicular activity number three, on the moon, in sec on the 2nd of August, 1971, Commander Scott, David Scott, made an experiment about uh, falling bodies, this time uh, without the atmospheric drag, so it was much, much better conditions than uh, Galileo had in Italy on the Tower of Pisa. So have a look and listen to Scott. Well, in my left hand, I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon? And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here, and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? <laughs> I'm not proof that Mr. Galileo was correct in his findings. <laughs> So, so Galileo was correct. That this was uh, proven on this experiment here on the moon. It is, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, let's talk about Newton. Newton, of course, uh, made major discoveries in uh, uh, 
the physical laws on one hand, the, mechanic, the mechanics, but also in the, the law of gravitation. Uh, <coughs> in fact, Newton is really at the foundation of classical mechanics with the uh, three laws that you see here. Uh, the law of inertia, the uh, relationship between the force and the acceleration that you get, uh, which is valid, of course, for uh, uh, the gravity. And also the fact that, uh, that the third law, the force, always come in pairs. If uh, an object is exercising a certain force on another body, that other body exercise the opposite force on the first object. So these are the fundamental laws of uh, mechanics. And uh, he was such a bright man that he had a lot of other discoveries, the law of universal gravitation, I'll come back to that, explanation of Kepler's laws, development of calculus shared with Leibniz, uh, which was needed as a development to understand gravity. For instance, if you have the gravity due to, the, to a big body like uh, the Earth, as you know, the gravitational field of the Earth outside of the Earth's surface is exactly as if all of the mass of the Earth was concentrated in the center. It's not at all obvious. And uh, he needed calculus in order to determine that, because you have uh, the attraction by all of these elements of, uh, uh, of this uh, big globe, and it's not at all obvious that it's as if the whole mass was focused, was concentrated at the, at the center. So he developed mathematics in order to solve the problems of gravity. Of course, we had uh, in optics the Newton telescope with reflecting mirrors. And uh, what is important is that the laws of Newton were so powerful, are still so powerful, that basically that's all you need to the calculations of orbit. The Apollo program, for instance, which was quite complex from an orbital mechanics point of view, including uh, orbit around the moon, detachment of the um, <coughs> lunar module, landing, then rendezvous uh, around the, the moon on orbit. This was all done with Newton's law. Uh, so very, very powerful laws and still in use today for most of the orbital mechanics calculations. Now this is the law of gravity, of course. The force of gravity between two bodies is equal to the gravitational constant, which is here, and I'm sure you know this by heart anyway, and then the product of the masses divided by the square of the distance between the two masses, or the center of the masses, if they are spherical. Now, um, <coughs> it's often believed that uh, Newton discovered the law of gravitation by watching apples fall from apple trees. <laughs> not quite true, that was not precise enough, but he uh, determined the force that was needed in order to keep the moon on its orbit. The distance of the moon was well known, the mass was pretty well known also, and he calculated the force needed to maintain the moon on the orbit, and he saw that there was this uh, factor one over r square, uh, <coughs> so the force diminishes like one over r square between the attraction between two masses. Now, remember the uh, distinction between mass and weight. Uh, strictly speaking, the, the weight, which is a force, is measured in Newton and not in kilogram, although we most of the time use kilogram. Uh, you don't go and buy uh, 10 Newton of carrots. If you ask that in the shop, uh, uh, people are not going to understand, you, you ask for one kilogram of, uh, of carrots. But anyway, if you have a mass of uh, 120 kilograms, which seems to be high for a person, but that person has a spacesuit, and uh, on the Earth, G approximately equal to 10 meters per second square, more precisely 9.81, gives you a weight of about uh, 1200 Newton. On the Moon, the mass is the same, but the G is about 1.6, the G value uh, on the Earth, so it gives you a weight of only 200 Newton, and you can divide by 10 approximately to find the value in kilogram, if you want really to talk about weight in kilogram. Uh, <coughs> only uh, 20 kilogram you would weigh on the Moon if you weigh 120 on the Earth. Now, uh, this uh, discovery by Galileo that uh, whatever the mass of the object is going to take the same time uh, to reach the ground if they are <coughs> uh, uh, left alone um, at the same height above the ground. Uh, of course, the law of Newton, and this helped a lot Newton to develop these, uh, these laws. Uh, basically, F, the force divided by the mass, is equal to acceleration. And as the force is proportional to the mass, if you divide by the mass, you see that whatever the mass is, acceleration is going to be the same. And acceleration is what changes the speed, what gives you the time it takes for an object to go from one place in a gravitational field uh, uh, to, 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 the, to the ground. Finally, Einstein. Uh, of course, he had a lot of contribution to physics. Uh, 
and he was a, an absolute genius. Uh, I'll mention, obviously, the special theory of relativity, which was developed when he was in Bern, working for the patent office. He didn't have a lot of money, so he had to give uh, private uh, physics lessons to students. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but anyway, developed special theory of relativity at that time in, um, in Bern. And the general theory of relativity was developed when he was in Germany, in uh, Berlin, uh, about 10 years later. And basically, the general theory of relativity that I won't expand in detail tonight is a theory of gravitation. And uh, one of the fundamentals of the special, excuse me, of the general theory of relativity is the so-called equivalence Principle, equivalence principle. Imagine these two conditions. You have a person inside a box without windows on the surface of the Earth, and you have the gravitation of 9.81 uh, meters per second square. You have that force that sticks you to the ground. And he said, and this is the equivalence uh, principle, that this is exactly like an astronaut in a spaceship uh, with a thruster that gives you exactly the same acceleration level, 9.81. Uh, meters per second squared. These situations are exactly the same, and whatever conclusion you get from one of these situations is applicable also to the other one. This is the equivalence principle. And uh, it has really interesting consequences, because imagine uh, you have now a rocket uh, on the Earth, you have this lady holding, let's say, a one kilogram mass uh, on her right hand, and of course, she feels that uh, weight of one kilogram, if she releases it, it's going to fall down uh, with a classical uh, law of uh, falling bodies. It will go five meters the first second, uh, 20 meters the second second, although it's going to be intercepted by the floor. And uh, according to the equivalence principle, this is exactly equivalent to the situation where you have that same person in a spaceship uh, in space far away from the Earth, here feeling the, the weight of this uh, one kilogram, and if she releases it, it's going to fall with exactly the same uh, uh, conditions that you have on Earth in this situation. This is the equivalence principle. And uh, it has amazingly interesting and far-reaching consequences. Because imagine, in this case here, the case of the rocket, imagine that you have a, <clears throat> a light source that is going to project a light beam perpendicular to the direction of the motion of the rocket. You know, the, the light doesn't move with a in, uh, infinitely, fast, infinitely fast. It's about 300,000 kilometers per second. It's about uh, 30 centimeters per nanosecond. A nanosecond is 10 to the minus 9 second, or one uh, billionth of a second. So um, <clears throat> this beam of light is going to cross that rocket in a few nanoseconds, OK, but not in a, in a uh, infinitely small time, in a few nanoseconds. Let's say after uh, a while it will reach the middle here, but a little bit lower than where it was emitted, and uh, after double the time it will uh, get to this point here. So, seen in this situation of the rocket accelerating, uh, the beam is bent, and the equivalence principle says it's exactly the same as will happen in this situation here, which means that it's as if masses were attracting uh, uh, lights of beam. Uh, beams of light, sorry. Uh, so the light is deflected by gravitational fields or by uh, uh, massive objects. And uh, this was proven a few years later. This was in 1919, so four years after uh, the um, general theory of relativity was established by Arthur Eddington observing a solar eclipse. And if you look here at this schematic here, you have the Earth, the Sun, that is uh, occulted by the moon. And this is the actual position of a star, but because of the bending of the light rays here, uh, the apparent position will be here. And uh, on this occasion, Arthur Eddington measured the position of the star, and they were exactly deflected uh, by the way that was predicted in the general theory of relativity by Einstein. So this is a proof that the equivalence principle was correct. Now, there are other consequences that I won't de detail, but uh, it's the way uh, time flows close to a massive object or further away from this massive object. It happens that time goes a little bit slower when you are close to the surface of the Earth than if you are far away. So this is a variation in the, the way time flows 
depending on where you are in the gravitational field. Uh, I won't talk about the, <laughs> the contraction of space, but that's also an effect. Pretty similar to what you have in uh, the special relativity, where depending on the velocity of the object, you have a contraction of space and a dilation of time. Here, it's not related to the velocity, but to the gravitational field. So the consequence is, if you, if you live on a high-rise building, it's much better to live in the lower floors, because time flows slower, so you will age less. <laughs> OK? And especially if you take a very, very high-rise building, like the uh, Burj Khalifa in, uh, in Dubai, uh, better live here than there. The view may not be as good, but you will live a little bit longer. In fact, on a total lifetime of, uh, let's say, about uh, 80 years, it gives you about a millionth of a second uh, gain in lifetime. So it may not be worth it, but, uh, but the theory says you will have a somewhat longer lifetime. OK, uh, get close to the end. Let's uh, say a few words about uh, Gravity the movie. It's a good movie, I think, and uh, the special effects are remarkable. Uh, looking at this movie, I really had some type of feeling I'm visually I'm there in space. Um, but at the beginning of the movie, you may remember, for the ones who saw it, uh, you see the shuttle, and in the shuttle, Payload Bay is the Hubble Space Telescope. And there are two people who are supposed to be working on the Hubble Space Telescope. This is Sandra Bullock, who is really working, and uh, George is fooling around. <laughs> and uh, this is maybe one of the mistakes in, uh, in the movie. Uh, on a typical space flight, everyone is busy, nobody is fooling around, and here George is fooling around. Yeah. Now, <laughs> a, a little later, after the destruction of the shuttle and the Hubble Space Telescope, which is a shame. You can't do that with the Hubble Space Telescope, which is such a noble spacecraft. But anyway, it's destroyed by space debris, a swarm of space debris. Uh, and then they decide, uh, Sandra Bullock and George, uh, to move as a train of space walkers with uh, <coughs> uh, cold gas thrusters on their backpack to move from the orbit of uh, Hubble and the shuttle, which is 28 degree inclination, to the orbit of the International Space Station, which is a completely different orbit, another altitude, and it's 51 degree inclination. Um, that's impossible. Either it would require enormous courage from these astronauts, or enormous amount of fuel. In fact, I had students uh, calculate the amount of fuel needed. It was several tons of propellant needed to, do, to, to achieve that. And of course, you wouldn't survive the, the days, uh, weeks, and months that would be needed to do that. So that's another mistake. And uh, the third one is uh, uh, this tether, which is horizontal. Tether is a cable, a cable. It's horizontal. And here you have Sandra Bullock and you have George. And there is a huge tension on this tether that doesn't exist. If you have a cable in space, it's on the, if it's on the local vertical, you have a tension on it because there's so-called gravity gradients. There is more gravity in the bottom than at the top. So you have a, uh, always tension on the vertical tether. On a horizontal tether, you have zero force. And finally, in order to save herself, she has to cut the tether, and George is moving away horizontally. No such force. So that's a mistake. It's a good movie. There are a few mistakes, and I mentioned three of them. OK, time to conclude, and I have uh, some remarks related to, to gravity. Um, how gravity affects life forms on the Earth it has a very strong dependence on the size and weight. This is a sea elephant, which is smaller than an Earth elephant, but this sea elephant taken on a, during a trip in, to Antarctica a couple of years ago. And obviously, the sea elephant is very affected by gravity. Uh, <clears throat> the ant is not too affected by gravity. So the effect of gravity on uh, life forms uh, on Earth depends very much on the size. And it's obvious because uh, the mass of a life form or any object varies as the cube of the size. Uh, if this is this big ant, let's say, one cubic centimeter, uh, <coughs> and if you take the same density and you take a, an animal that has roughly, let's say, two meters by two meters by two meters, it's uh, eight cubic meters, it's eight million cubic centimeters. So the mass changes very, very rapidly with the size. So big animals are so massive that they are affected by gravity, much more so than small animals. So that's one interesting uh, finding. 
the effect of gravity on life form depends significantly on the size. And um, in nature, gravity affects big objects like galaxies. And I mentioned already uh, planetary systems and stars. Evolution of stars is very much driven by gravity. Uh, and uh, the behavior of galaxies, which is a beautiful picture taken by Hubble not long ago with a, uh, two interacting galaxies. So gravitationally, they are deformed uh, one another because of gravity forces. Uh, gravity affects big objects in the universe in a significant manner. Uh, Subatomic particles that couldn't care less about gravity. You have the weak force, the strong force, electromagnetic forces, which are significantly larger than gravity forces. The subatomic particles do not care. Okay, another message that I would like to pass, uh, last but not least, a warm message of congratulation to Samantha Cristoforetti. She's an ESA slash Italian astronaut on board the International Space Station. And last week, she had her 100 day in space, and you see here the 100 days in space. And uh, like all ESA astronauts in the recent uh, past in the International Space Station, she has been performing very well. She has another 70 or 80 days to spend uh, in space until this summer. But anyway, I would like to wish a warm message of congratulation and uh, uh, <coughs> uh, congratulations for a job well done, and she's doing extremely well. Okay, this is the, the last slide, take home message. You can forget everything I said, but I would like you to remember these points. Um, gravity is everywhere. Sometimes we use the word zero gravity, but gravity is everywhere. You can take out the gravity by inertial forces, typically the uh, uh, centrifugal force on a, uh, <coughs> uh, on a circular orbit around the Earth compensates exactly the gravity force so that inside you have quote-unquote zero gravity, but basic gra gravity is everywhere. There are ways of modulating gravity, especially in fast airplanes. Zero-g experience is fun. Try it if you have the opportunity. The laws of Newton are very powerful and precise for most applications in orbital mechanics. We still use them uh, constantly today. And remember the equivalence principle. There will be no test at the end of this lesson, but remember the equivalence principle, because it has far-reaching consequences. Life forms are affected by gravity, essentially depending on their size and weight. I think the picture I showed demonstrates that clearly. Galaxies care, subatomic particles don't care. Thank you for your attention. Hello, I'm, uh, I'm Dimitri Psaltis. I'm the dean of the engineering school where Claude was. Make a little observation. We all know that George Clooney is one of the coolest guys on the planet. <laughs> but seeing them both in spacesuits, I would say that uh, among astronauts, Claude is definitely the coolest of them all. So, <laughs> so it's, uh, uh, it's been a real pleasure uh, being your colleague the last eight or so years. One of the nicest, most distant men I've had the chance to work with. It's been my pleasure. It's also my pleasure to present you with a certificate. I can get my hands. Fighting gravity here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'll read a little bit uh, the, uh, the citation. It says, L'Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne, sur proposition de la Conférence du Corps de Seignan de CERN. Le titre professeur honoraire à Monsieur professeur Claude Nicolier, un témoignage d'admiration pour son parcours exceptionnel de scientifique dans le domaine de l'astronautique et de l'aéronautique, sa capacité à faire briller la recherche suisse au plan international et en reconnaissance de son engagement à transmettre son savoir aux étudiants avec cette extraordinaire capacité à faire rêver en partageant sa passion for the exploration of space. Uh, it's signed by Odd Biard, the president of the Conference of the Corps Enseignant, 
and also by Patrick Ebisher. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. I think it works. So, Claude, do you remember the first lesson you taught me? <laughs> don't was, take were, yourself seriously. There were so many that I don't yeah. even remember. <laughs> <laughs> and do you remember the last lesson you taught me? It was yesterday. In front of such an audience, stay natural. So, I have a little story for you and I hope that I will be able to apply these two lessons. Okay. Okay? So, um, I wouldn't mind if you could hold this for me for a okay, little second. Okay, i hold it. Because I'll talk to you, but I'll also I'm not going to, talk I'm not to going them. to drop it, although it's interesting to drop it, but I, won't, I will keep it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, I have a little confession for you and you today. Uh, when I first came to the EPFL for my interview to become secretary of the Space Center, it went very well. And at the end, uh, Maurice Bourgeau said I would be working with Claude Nicolier. And my jaw dropped. And I was thinking, Claude Nicohu? <laughs> Who could that ever be? But of course, I needed the job, and I said that it would be quite an honor to work for him. Now, the very same day, believe me, I went to this bookshop. It was a second-hand bookshop, and this here book almost fell upon me. And I discovered that Claude Nicowat was, in fact, Claude Nicolier. And that um, he was an astronaut. So, of course, I read the book. I took the book home. I read it from cover to cover. And I was very, very impressed. In anticipation of the day I would meet you, I would read the book and read it and read it. And that day finally came, where you walked in the office. I was so disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> By the book. <laughs> because... <laughs> the book never says that you are the coolest person on Earth and beyond. Never. You don't believe me? I couldn't sleep this morning. I made a list. It starts here. Can you see that? Yes. Can you generosity read it? Generosity stamp, yes. Generosity, generosity stamp. Let yeah, kindness. Kindness. Devotion. And I'll just have an, a little illustration of this. One or two, if you don't mind. Um, do you know that he always has stamps in his drawer? Because we might need them. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know that he came to the, center, to the Space Center to remind us ladies that it was International Women's Day last Sunday? <laughs> Next time, Claude, please tell my husband he forgot. <laughs> <laughs> One day, he brought flowers for my birthday. It was a Friday, do you remember? Yeah, I do, yeah. Okay. I wasn't in the office. The flowers withered the entire weekend in the office. Do you know what he did? He came back on Monday with a fresh bouquet, just for me. <laughs> well, it's normal. <laughs> I find this normal. <laughs> <laughs> so, I just have one more on the list, and it's, it's right, right here at the bottom. <laughs> I 
Here, could you read that wow. one? Wow. <laughs> Humble, modest, humility. Yeah. Never brag. Oh, that's for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's my reminder. It's because you never, ever brag about your career. There's no reason to. On the, on the contrary, you help it to bring people up and to see beyond. Thank you. Thanks to you. <laughs> so. Thank you. So. Thank you. My, my uh, official job in coming up here was just to delic delicately bring you over there. So we're going to do that right okay. now. Okay. <laughs> so yes, Claude. Um, and for you who don't know me, my name is Volker Gass. I'm the director of the Swiss Space Center, and it's been my privilege uh, to host Claude, because I'm not his boss. Nobody can be his boss. He, we can learn so much from him for the last years, and I hope for the months to come. And I got tasked with a fantastic job and extremely difficult to find a gift for such an inspiring person that's been four times in space. What do you give him? You can't give him a rubber Swiss cube. I mean, we've given those out all over in Switzerland. So we figured, Claude, you always wanted to go towards space and you were stopped at about 850 kilometers, right? Or what was Hubble's orbit? 600, yeah. 600 only, oh, la la, 600 only. only. 600. <laughs> but uh, when he speaks about also the Mars One plan, you told me last year that that's something, yes, I would do maybe. Maybe I would go if I had a chance. So what we found, we nearly as good as that. We found a piece of Mars and we brought it to you. Oh, so I don't have to go to Mars. Yeah? Well, you can still go, but I mean, it's to inspire you. And we found um, an artist, Don Canton de Vaux, didn't have to go very far, that put this in shape. And uh, Martin, uh, tu peux dévoiler. So in the name of EPFL, of the STI, and of the Swiss Space Center. Wow. We give you a meteorite from Mars. And uh, we'll have much more time the next days to explain the whole sculpture here. Uh, so this is in levitation. This represents the solar system, the, uh, sorry, the galaxy, the solar system, the sun, piece of Mars, the impact crater, the Earth's orbit. And um, so maybe you can't gaze at stars always, but you'll always have on your desk or in a place in your home uh, something that came from the solar system to you. And That's thank you wonderful. very much. Yeah, thanks to you, Marco. Thank you very much. OK, so I will conclude. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Thank you for honoring Claude and um, for bringing him back something like that. I've been to a few honorous lectures, but never one in the convention center. So thank you again so much for coming. It's a privilege to have you here. And uh, we hope to see you all soon uh, in different foras, in space, in what the APFL is doing. And I wish you a great evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>